Let's get started focusing on some of the key terms and ideas, and then we'll roll into some best practice infrastructure. Let's start off with just a little funny anecdote. Here's the street that I used to live on in San Luis Obispo. Doesn't it look pretty? I've put a number of interventions there that really just throw out convention. There's games, there's play, there's art. And when we talk about moving beyond streets or moving beyond complete streets, the idea is who occupies the street? Who actually controls the right-of-way and lives in that right-of-way? How can it be shared and occupied? And that's where we're going. But before we go there, let's cover some key terms. A first key term to understand, particularly in dialoguing with transportation engineers, is the idea of trip generation. Trip generation is the number of trips that a certain land use generates. It's based on the expected use, based on numerous cases throughout the United States, and is in a manual called the ITE Manual, or the Institute of Transportation Engineers Manual. Following on from trip generation is a key concept of trip degeneration. The idea that we would need to reduce the number of trips generated that is assigned to each land use. Trip degeneration involves reducing the number of trips that we estimate comes from those land uses. Think of it as subtracting things like packed spy traffic, diverted traffic, how many trips are captured in a mixed use development, etc. There are many ways to do this and most of them are estimates, but it's important to understand the concept. Now that you understand how trips are generated, it's important to factor in how they are assigned to roadways. This is called trip assignment. Now, trip assignment is simply how those land uses that generate trips assigns those trips to the road. Roads are pipes. Pipes carry water. Pipes carry people. Pipes carry cars. Think of that analogy when you're thinking of trip assignment. Level of service is a product of trip assignment. For cars, level of service is a masses to a grade, but is really a function of how those trips that are assigned and generated are dispersed on roads, how they take up right-of-way and capacity. Now, does those trips that are assigned that factor into level of service include bicycle and pedestrian trips? Any guesses? Well, the answer is no. We have to have another factor that measures level of service, and we call that multimodal level of service. Multimodal level of service considers non-automotive traffic via bicycling and walking, and it develops service standards for those modes. Now, important thing to remember with this is that it does not do it synonymously or at the same time as a traditional auto level of service model. It is additive. So, you would have your auto level of service, your bicycle level of service, and your pedestrian level of service all in a multimodal level of service model. They aren't integrated. Important factor to consider as we're rethinking how we consider and design the streets of the future, how we move beyond complete streets. Now, before the meet, let's just go over a few more terms, and they may make you hungry because many of them have food references. First, mode. We use that a lot in transportation. That is just the transportation types. Now let's get into our food terms. Road diet, lane reduction, breadcrumbs, trail street markings, and that's usually for bikes. A pork chop, island median and pedestrian refuge. A bike box is the green box that you see in front of cars. We sometimes call that a Portland left. An RRFB, definitely an acronym that you hear all the time. It is a rapid rectangular flashing beacon a beacon that flashes and activates as a caution for drivers. A high intensity activated crosswalk is also another type of beacon. It's activated with a time phase to allow for traffic meeting or what we call platooning for pedestrians when they stick together like a school of fish. Now let's focus on the types of bike lanes. These are very important, so pay attention. I've got them all there on the screen for you. Class one is an off street separated bike lane. Think of it synonymously with a multi-use path. Class two is when you see a striped on-street bike lane. Class three is when you share the road. And many times, in best applications, it's made distinct by what we call sharrows. Class four, which is a new designation 
from an engineering standpoint, is an off-street, protected and grade-separated bikeway. It's many times called a cyclotrack. And the key there is that it's grade-separated. It has a grade separation from both the street and the pedestrian streetscape. Two more terms. Shera, which, which I used, involves a bice symbol with chevrons, or arrows, which indicates a share-the-road situation for cyclists, as well as a super shero. Now, a super shero is also referred to as a greenback shero, which is a shero that on a solid green gradient versus the traditional outline you would see as a shero. Now, let's focus on the design of the street. As we dive into this, it's important to note that it's not just the streetscape elements that make it pleasant. The configuration of the urban street, work, street network and the typology of the road is a key determinant of movement. While this is founded much in theory, for example, that of Hillier, it's easily depicted in the networks that we showed before. Here's again the grid of Manhattan in Greater New York, as opposed to the suburban grid that we saw before. You can see clearly the differences between those two visuals. One facilitates via a network bicycle and pedestrian travel. The other is more suburban. This idea is capitalized on and has been capitalized on by many theorists over time. One of the most prominent thinkers in this area has been Donald Appleyard and his partner, Alan Jacobs, who focused on the idea of livable streets and protected neighborhoods. These are areas that recognize that streets have become dangerous and they need to become more livable and bikeable. Sanctuaries, communities, resident areas, livable places, we know the terminology, but how do they manifest themselves? One of the ways they do so is by facilitating varied facades, trees and vegetations, bulb outs, and textured surfaces. All of these are enabled by the policies that we dialogued as a part of the last chapter Again, let's take a look at another streetscape. Here are trees and vegetations, unique signage, bollards and mountable curves, very generous bulb outs, as well as a unique surface, all of which facilitate a more comfortable cycling and walking environment. Apple Yard and Jacobs would state that a requirement for a complete street is that it have acceptable speeds, volumes, and noise levels, as well as have infrastructure that supports reduction in accidents and improved right-of-way for pedestrians and cyclists. This is something that's not new. It's been done since the middle of the last century. One of the first attempts at doing this is Clarence Perry's neighborhood unit, which established in 1929. And yet, the suburban build-offs of that did not capture enough right-of-way in the street to really make it complete. A better example is the European context, which we see throughout Amsterdam and Copenhagen, called the Bunerf, which is a residential street designed for mixed volume and traffic flow, which moves beyond the U.S. idea of the complete street. It embraces the 5D variables, which we consider essential for bicycling and walking behavior. These include density, diversity, design, destination, and demographic. Building off these, there are several rules of thumb to keep in mind. Cycleways should be six feet with a three feet buffer. Bike lanes should also be six feet. Travel lanes should be pushed to 10 or 11 feet. Parking should be pushed to eight feet. Planting wells should be five feet and a typical sidewalk should have a minimum of 15 feet. Now you may be looking out your window wondering, that seems obtuse. These streets are not mine. Well, these challenge the status quo in terms of our streets. And now we're gonna look at a number of streetscapes and we're gonna test these. Now these are real streetscapes and we're going to evaluate whether or not they fit these rule of thumb paradigms. Here's complete street scenario one. Just how complete is it? You can see here that there are some anomalies. We have a very wide bus lane, for example. We also have 
a nicely sized six foot bike lane, which fit within our rule of thumb standards. But can you see any variation with regard to our auto travel lane? This is a very narrow auto travel lane and challenges the status quo in terms of how we design complete streets. It has a, it has a nine foot driveway. One challenge here though, is that we only leave six feet for the sidewalk. Now look at this scenario. Again, we see a reduced right-of-way for autos and shared space for cycles, but we see reduced space for pedestrians. This should be more generous. Scenario three offers a different paradigm for the same right-of-way. What if we were to actually create more pedestrian space, almost 20 feet in this case? And yet, there's still something wrong with this. As you can see, we haven't allocated the appropriate buffer between our bike lane and the cars. Now, I don't expect all of you to remember every last detail, and every state has different requirements in terms of what you can do in terms of allocating the right-of-way, but it's important to challenge what can be done as we move forward. Particularly, this comes to a head when we consider street art and furniture. The literature specifically says that the more visual interest and the more things that we can actually put out that create that visual interest, for example, signs and benches, parking meters even, newspaper boxes, bollards, all of these factors can play into how we shape the streetscape for walking and biking. Maybe even as much as throwing street furniture out in the middle of the roadway right-of-way. As you can see in this humorous little picture that I provided. In addition, what's really critical is providing active uses. Shops, restaurants, parks, all these type of uses create significant pedestrian and bicycle traffic. We also see that the proportion of windows on the first floor has a strong connection with bicycle and pedestrian activity on the street. The more transparency that we can create facilitates more interaction, so we can actually create more vitality and more activity along that streetscape. Again, the point of this is to think beyond the street, and part about thinking about that is to think beyond the actual infrastructure of the street. Think beyond the physical right-of-way there and to move into the built environment. 